Buju Nimashomas. Open our hearts today to allow our very being to be molded by you through this conversation we are going to have today. Come, Holy Spirit, open our minds to a different way of thought and a different way of understanding that might be our own. And good afternoon to all of you. Tanse, Buzu, Anin. That's greeting in um, Ojibwe, Cree, and Oji Cree, all of which, um, all of those people who worship with me at Place of Hope Presbyterian Church. I thank you for taking the time to come and listen to me today. <clears throat> I thank you for Knox College for bringing me here to witness to you all that Jesus is alive and at work in Winnipeg Inner City Missions and in Place of Hope Presbyterian Church, transforming lives. <clears throat> I work on behalf of the Presbyterian Church, so for most of you, that means that we are working in a work of healing and reconciliation and transformation of lives together. <clears throat> My name is Thundering Eagle Woman. I am Bear Clan. I'm, member of, um, I'm a member of Bingwe, Nayashi, and Anishinaabek First Nations, where my First Nation family comes from. BNA is an Ojibwe First Nation in Northwest Ontario, in the east side of Lake Nipigon. My name is Margaret Iveen Mullen. I come from down the Boom Road, near Miramichi, New Brunswick, where my settler family comes from. I am an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church of Canada, ordained to word and sacrament. I carry an eagle staff, which was given to me by my traditional indigenous elders, which gives me the authority to bring our sacred teachings into the church. I am a liberal theologian, and I am a flaming evangelical Christian. I am Anishinaabe Quay and I am Christian. It's all interrelated, interconnected, and interdependent in me, and unless you're me, I don't expect you to understand that. <clears throat> I am not confused. All I can do is trust God and depend on God to help me gather it all together in a good way. I acknowledge also the First Nations people of the land that we are on at this moment of time right here in this place and also out there in the territories of those who are joining us by live stream. When I stop to acknowledge First Nations, Inuit or Métis territories at the beginning of any gathering that I am invited to, I admit that there were already people living a good life here on Turtle Island long before European Christendom contact. There were civilizations, there were families. They lived here and they worked together here on this land hundreds of thousands of years ago. I'm here to bear witness to the fact that you can't discover a land that is already occupied. The indigenous people of Canada were given the responsibility by God for being the groundskeepers of this land that we now call Canada. And they have, we have, been good stewards of that land. I also, when I acknowledge the territory on which I am standing, admit to my own complicity in all the attempts at ethnic cleansing and genocide that the first peoples of this land have endured. That may sound harsh, but it is true. First, I confess that I am angry and impatient with the government and with the church. Both are moving too slowly. <clears throat> I also confess that it makes me really nervous to speak to academics and theologians in the hallowed halls of our church's theological seminary. I am bound to quote somebody who has published something or said something profound to me in the past 
So I am just going to write off the beginning, credit my primary living and written resources before I even begin this lecture. I credit Jesus first. First and foremost, the living word of God. I credit the continual illumination of the Holy Spirit that it's at work in my life and within the church. I credit the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, the United Declarations on Indigenous Rights, Reconciliation Canada, and Kairos for my evolving thoughts on reconciling with Indigenous peoples. I credit the National Forum on Literacy and Poverty put on by Frontier College in 2017, the 2016 Statistics Canada report that was called Insights on Canadian Society, and Canada Without Poverty, which is a charity with the purpose of eliminating poverty in Canada, all for my illuminating thoughts on poverty. I credit my Indigenous elders' teachings, ceremonies, and storytelling. I credit the daily lived experience of the Indigenous and non-Indigenous people that I've had the privilege to journey with during my lifetime. I do not expect you in this room, or those of you listening to me on live stream, to agree with everything I say today. However, I do expect you to be disturbed by what disturbs God. The church called my Ojibwe beautiful, God-directed way of being sinful. The church decided that my Ojibwe sacred teachings and ceremonies were evil. That has wounded me personally, my family, and all of the people that I work with who are Indigenous and working with at our mission and in our ministry. Colonization and residential schools have had devastating effects. I expect that to disturb you. And when you get disturbed, I expect you to engage in or to continue to engage in more deeply the conversation of reconciliation between the church and indigenous peoples of this land. It's not okay to do nothing. This is not a historical problem. I am standing in your midst. When I say I expect you to be disturbed, I don't want you to feel guilty or to carry shame. That's not what I'm about. You did not do this. You do, however, have a responsibility to work with God now in God's work of healing and reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. You have a responsibility now to honor the treaties that this country is founded on. The work of reconciliation is going to be impossible without your willingness to accept the truth about a shared history here in Canada that has had devastating effects on me. And the conversation will only continue as you're able to believe that Indigenous worldview and spiritual understanding is valid and is equally, be, equally valuable in this conversation. I need to tell you this conversation of reconciliation has began for me at the moment of my conception. I was conceived by a First Nations woman and an Indigenous man here in Canada. Now that fact has brought with it an inherent need for me to understand the heritage and the history of Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in this land. Well, no, actually, the conversation goes further back to the day when Ontario Children's Aid scooped my mother and my Uncle Bill off our reserve when Mum was only three years old. That was 89 years ago, way before I was born. They were scooped off that reserve, away from their families, away from their cultures, away from their spiritual heritage. 
What made stealing mum from her family possible was the Articles of Canada's Constitution, which did not define Indigenous people as human beings, and did define us as a problem, a problem of a state, making it necessary to eradicate us or to take the Indian out of the Indian, to humanize us as if we weren't human already, and to Christianize us because that was the thing to do. Actually, a conversation started at first contact here on Turtle Island with the arrival of the European settlers. And that's about 500 years ago now. Back then, a land was considered unoccupied if there were no Christians in it. And it was okay for a Christian nation to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all pagans whatsoever. It's in the Constitution. It became possible to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all pagans whatsoever. That's called the Doctrine of Discovery. It was written back in the 15th century, so we're going back further again in history. <clears throat> but it wasn't just the 15th century that we need to go back to. The Doctrine of Discovery was made possible in the 4th century when the Emperor of Rome gave Christians the power of the empire and Christendom was born. With the church embedded in the empire, Augustine, a great theologian, came up with the idea of just war, which allowed Christians to use the power of the empire to, pu to punish and conquer all infidels. Dr. Visitors, can you explain to me how the Church of Christ got from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount to the idea of just war. I encourage you all to study that history, to better understand how the church got to this place where confession, apology, and reconciliation with indigenous peoples has become necessary. As you listen to me, the people that I am ministering to on a daily basis, the people that I live with and walk with, the people who have invited me into their lives, are those people that you see here on the screen in front of you. I'm not talking about issues here. I'm talking about issues that have affected human beings and are still affecting human beings. I think that basically all I can do is encourage you to cry with me, to weep with Jesus over the brokenness of the situation that we have here in Canada. And then to join me in a living and ongoing conversation of healing and reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples on this land. Now, I know that many of you are already engaged. It's an honor for me to have been asked to join you on your personal and corporate journeys of understanding, compassion, and action. For those of you who are just engaging in the conversation, I want you to know that it's okay to ask. It's okay to not understand. It's okay to be uncomfortable and to feel unsafe in this conversation. It's not, and it is okay, it is okay to not know what to do. But I'm here to challenge you because for as long as we are waiting for Jesus to return and for as long as the grass grows and the rivers flow, it's never going to be okay. 
by creator standards, by God's standards, to do nothing about the injustices that have been and are still being done to indigenous peoples here in Canada. These are turbulent times that we are living in. The reason I have titled my lecture what I have titled my lecture about, you know, joining me in the rapids um, is because in our teachings and, and as the treaties were made, um, our indigenous people um, honored those treaties by, by making what they call the two row wampum belt. Now, that belt is meant to signify the river of life that we are all navigating in. And there's two rows that are going directly in the same direction, parallel with each other. And our treaties are meant to bring us together, to create friendships, to help us to live in peace and harmony together. Unfortunately, I see that we focus on the problems. And we keep paddling our own canoes through the rapids. And it is rapids that we're encountering. You know, that the atmosphere is not quiet out there. And it's not comfortable. And it's not safe. Maybe we need to get in the same canoe navigate the rapids together the way I've had to do that all of my life and focus more on how we can live in right relationships instead of focusing on the problems that there are between the two nations. <clears throat> I'm here to bear witness that generational trauma is still being experienced by indigenous peoples and so are the people who have agreed to allow me to show you their faces today. Generational trauma has caught, that was caused by colonization on the residential schools. It is holding back my First Nations kith and kin, and it is holding the back the people that I journey with and love so deeply at Winnipeg Inner City Missions. I am here to bear witness that there are members of Place of Hope Presbyterian Congregation and people that we serve at Winnipeg Inner City Missions that are currently trapped in what I can only describe as the valley of the shadow of death. There's no way else to describe it. Our Sunday, every Sunday at church, the prayers of the people, they look something like this. And these are these people asking me to pray for them. Pray for my brother. His addictions are ruining his life and breaking our family apart. He's giving mom pills to make her sleep and using her money to feed his addiction. I am so afraid he'll die. Three of my brothers have already died in their addictions. I'm here to bear witness that addictions are a problem with a face and a name and a family that is being destroyed. And that people normally get wound up in their addictions because there is so much pain in their life and that pain has been directly caused by colonization in the residential schools. Please, say one of these people. Pray for a new home for us. The neighborhood where we are is not safe for our children. And there is black mold all over the place in our house. Deplorable housing and unsafe communities are a problem for your brothers and sisters in Christ in Winnipeg this week. That makes it today. That makes it your brothers and sisters in Christ within the Presbyterian Church in Canada. That's who you are looking at here. Someone else says, pray for my 15-year-old niece. 
She's been missing for a week now. <clears throat> Pray for my 10-year-old friend at school. She's been missing for four days. I can't sleep. I'm so worried about her. We've looked everywhere. I'm here to bear witness that murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls, LGBTQ and 2S persons is a problem that has gained national attention. Some of these missing and murdered people are my own congregation's relatives. I had a 10-year-old say to me this past Sunday, pray for my 14-year-old brother. Four men pulled knives on him, stole his bike. He only got away because he ran into the 7-Eleven. I had a woman ask me, pray for my 25-year-old nephew. He was stabbed to death last night. Violent crime is an ongoing problem. And the perpetrators and the victims are sometimes both people I know and love. Another woman says, pray for my husband. Our four grandchildren were taken from our daughter on the weekend by Child and Family Services. And now we are looking after them to keep them out of foster care. I'm here to bear witness that Indigenous children are being taken and placed in foster care at an alarming rate in Canada. Pray for my granddaughter. She's in jail. It's not safe for her there. I'm here to bear witness that Indigenous people are being incarcerated in Canada at a higher rate than anywhere else in the world. That is a problem. It's a problem that affects members of my congregation. It's a problem that affects your Presbyterian brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for my husband. He's blind and his dialysis isn't working anymore. Diabetes is devastating our First Nations people. Food insecurity is a complicating issue to anyone who's living with diabetes. And that is a problem that is affecting all ages. And it's a problem that has names and faces that you see right here on the screen. These people that you have been looking at, they all have names and they all have tragic histories. And they are all resilient, they are all beautiful, they're all strong. They encourage me and they pray for me and they pray for the church and they pray for each other. They've asked me to bear witness that love is alive. Hope is alive, and Jesus is at work at Winnipeg Inner City Missions in place of Hope Presbyterian Church. Now, people of the church, ask me, what can we do? What can we do? How can we engage in the conversation of reconciliation between Indigenous people and the church in a good way? I wish I knew. How do we live together in peace? How do we cooperate together even if we strongly disagree with each other? How do we enter into conversations about our differences and still be friends with each other? You know, the, the PCC confession and apology, it was a good start. But that confession and the church's repentance for what it has done in the past is meaningless if nothing changes. And for those people, 
nothing has changed. Nothing. Why people are still dying out there. They are experiencing deep poverty and all the social ills that bring with it, and it's not their fault. Let the story impact you. Let the story affect you. Let the story make you weep with me. Maybe all we can do at this point in history as a church and as individual followers of Jesus is to continue to listen deeply to the indigenous people of the land and to lament. I call you to lament because it's an ancient prayer form of the Hebrew people of God. Only in the pain of lament, the reality of what the church has done can be encountered in a safe way. Only in the pain of lament can the reality of the church's complicity with the government of Canada to take the Indian out of the Indian can be faced. Only in the pain of lament can we face our own complicity and our own failed responsibility to God for maintaining good relationships with others and for maintaining and, and caretaking this earth. Only in the pain of lament can it all be faced. Because in lament, there's also this deep and underlying knowing that God will show up. God will show up somehow, someday, and do something good for us through it all. Until we know what that good is going to be, there is a lot you can do. Come on a mission tour to Winnipeg Inner City Missions. Don't come to bring us your charity. Come to build relationships with us. Visit one of the eight Indigenous Presbyterian missions that the Presbyterian Church in Canada operates. Do you even know who they are? You could call the Treaty Commission and ask which Indigenous territory you're living on and ask for a copy of the treaty and then maybe even read it. Those treaties are living documents that cannot be ignored. Treaties that were meant to carve out opportunities for the future for Indigenous peoples. Are we living up to the promises that we made in those treaties? Treaties, you know, are legally enforceable. Nation-to-nation -nation agreements that were and are being broken and trampled on We've just been through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I invite you. No, I think I'm challenging you, especially the people in this room. Read through the Truth and Reconciliation Report if you have not done so already. Read through its 94 calls to action. Digest the recommendations that it is making. They are a way forward. You don't have to work on all 94. Pick one. Do something about it. Get a copy of the United Nations Declaration on Indigenous Rights. Read through it. If you don't have the time or the will to read through those larger documents, at least absorb the preambles of both of them.
there's something else you can do. Start giving voice to indigenous people. Let us speak for ourselves. We've been waiting for a long time to share our wisdom and our perspective. If you want to witness the history in a particular moving way, do the Kairos blanket exercise. It'll only take you an afternoon. Wherever you are, demonstrate pure acceptance of the indigenous peoples of this land. Respect their spirituality and leave the judgment to Jesus, please. Welcome the fire and the smudge and the drum, indigenous wisdom and sacred teachings into the Christian church. Be an ally for indigenous peoples out there in the world. Confront stereotypes and racism in your own home, in your school, at your work. I'm particularly asking those people who are within hearing of my voice to be the conscience of the church. I can't be everywhere at once. You know, there's only three ordained Presbyterian ministers of indigenous heritage within the whole Presbyterian church in Canada. We need you to be an ally for us. We need you to be the conscience of the church. Before any agreements are made about work with indigenous peoples, make sure that the indigenous voices are heard. There's something else you can do. Reconciliation Canada is a wonderful organization. It's indigenous led. It is a safe place to get involved. Consider meeting in reconciliation circles with indigenous peoples. Everyone in those circles are equal in creator's sight. And everyone in the circle has something important to contribute. And the circle is not done until those contributions have been entered. It's easy, contact Reconciliation Canada. They're probably operating circles here in Toronto, somewhere. Indigenous people are speaking more and more out there in our society through books, the YouTube, film, the arts. Engage in those things. Spend one night listening to the APTN news instead of the CTV or the CBC national news. Did you know that our elders do not readily share in the conversation of reconciliation with the church due to the lack of trust that has developed between the church and indigenous peoples over the history of, that we have had here in Canada? Our elders have much wisdom and they carry old answers to the contemporary problems that we face as a global society. I'm here to directly challenge the church. I know if I keep putting it out there into the atmosphere often enough that maybe my cry will be heard. Put more adequate human and financial resources in place today in your eight ministries with indigenous peoples to help us do our work in a good way. Did you know that there is a National Native Ministries Council in the Presbyterian Church in Canada? 
Did you know that our council has no formal connection to justice ministries within the structures of our church? And did you know that we have no way within the current structures of the church to address and challenge the assembly of our church as the council? That's going to take the will of the assembly. And there's only three of us in the church, so how do we get to the assembly? I get to attend assembly once every six years. I can, I can send through my presbytery overtures to the general assembly, and we have done that. But it's not enough. Let the indigenous story shock you, disturb you, and push you into some kind of action. Please, speak up. Get engaged. Reconciliation is one person at a time, one act at a time, one moment at a time, until we can move forward together in a good way. It's okay to not know how to amend the deep divide that exists between us today. But it is not okay to do nothing. I personally remain hopeful that our church will find the way. I'm hopeful because I know the Holy Spirit is already in my tomorrow and in the church's tomorrow preparing that way. And I know that the Holy Spirit is at work right here in this room and out there in live stream land. And who knows how she'll work, eh? Thanks be to God. Megwitch, thank you for listening. All my relations.